I'd like to talk to you today about auditory processing. Uh, this is a really huge subject and it's something that impacts virtually everyone walking on the planet today. And it's one of those areas that is generally misperceived, uh, not given the sufficient attention, and really misunderstood. If I look at children and I look at their development, pretty much at the top of the list of what really is significant and important in terms of its global effects on the child is auditory processing. Essentially, auditory processing, as we define it, refers to how much auditory information, language information, the brain takes in and to what degree the brain understands that information. It's a function that develops sequentially. That is, the brain learns to take in pieces and then more pieces together and more pieces together and builds. The, the basis of conceptual thought, and we'll define conceptual thought as the ability to think in words, is auditory processing, auditory sequential processing. Now, part of why this is such an important issue today is that there are many things that are interfering with this development in many, many, many of our children. And there's some of them that, some of the issues that are health related and there's some that are societal related and family related and school related. You know, starting off with the issues that are affecting it that are health related. Uh, top of that list is a problem with fluid in the middle ear. Now, fluid in the middle ear is very significant because fluid in the middle ear affects how sound gets transmitted through the ear to the brain. And because fluid tends to keep changing, it affects the consistency with which the brain is receiving that input. It's actually the brain that hears, all right? The ear transmits sound, but it's the brain that learns how to hear and differentiate between different frequencies of sound. And if that brain is receiving good quality input, consistent input, the brain learns how to do that pretty well and it learns how to do it pretty fast. If we have kids with chronic middle ear fluid, the brain does not get that quality input. Now the reason this is such a huge problem is it's a problem that falls through the gaps. To test middle ear fluid, you do a simple little test called a tympanogram. Tympanogram is not a test typically done by a pediatrician. Your pediatrician, when they're doing a check on your child, will look in the ears and if the eardrum is bulging out dramatically, uh, they can detect that. But generally, they cannot look in your child's ear and see if there's a fluid problem. Generally, the concern when a doctor is looking in your child's ear is does your child have an ear infection? And if you will, you know, we can categorize that as a disease and the medical community treats disease. It really doesn't treat development, you know, unless we get into this perceptual, perception problem in terms of what the job is, what the role is of the medical community. So the doctors may be looking in your child's ear and looking to see if there's an ear infection and maybe as a secondary thing, look to see if there's a lot of fluid. Their concern about fluid is, is there enough fluid to cause irritation, which is then going to produce an ear infection. So it doesn't get picked up by the pediatricians. Then where does it get picked up? Well, it gets picked up by an ENT, and the child generally only is going to see an ENT unless they've got pretty significant chronic problems and get referred by the pediatrician to the ENT. And ENTs will pick up when they do the tympanogram if there's a fluid problem. Then we have another problem, all right? And that is the perception of how much fluid is a problem. You know, actually, if you get a tympanogram and it's considered normal, that doesn't mean there is not any fluid. And generally, it doesn't take much fluid and variation of fluid to create a problem with this tonal processing issue. 
So sadly, you can even get a tympanogram. The results are it's normal, but those results may not be good relative to tonal processing and the development of understanding development of language that comes with it. So this is a huge problem. Further problem is what causes the fluid. You know, <clears throat> this is this is an issue because uh, it appears to be that the primary cause of fluid issues or close to are dairy products which produce mucus and produce fluid in the middle air. Uh, huge problem, you know, but we're bombarded all the time with milk is the greatest thing for you, all right? Greatest thing for your children. Well, you know, maybe not so. You know, maybe that protein actually isn't digested properly. Maybe we've got problems with mucus production. Maybe that produces problems with fluid congestion, all right? Uh, you know, we've, we've seen children who stopped using dairy products who all of a sudden no longer had asthma and all of a sudden could hear and all of a sudden could talk uh, just by clearing up that issue. Right, so that's, that's a problem and that's a huge problem affecting many, 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 many of our children. Then we have the other aspect of uh, auditory processing which is receiving significant input, sufficient input, in, the, in terms of being talked to enough. Now that creates another whole, you know, problem. Uh, one of the things that has changed dramatically in the last 50 years in the United States is a perception of what constitutes an opportunity for a young child and perception of parents' role with young children. Uh, Fifty years ago, it was very, very rare that a child went to school of any, any form until they were five or six years of age. Uh, pretty much preschools didn't exist, daycares didn't exist, and for the most part, children were, were with parents or grandparents or extended family, and as such received a lot of one-on-one -on -one language interaction. You know, when an adult is talking to a child, when the adult is trying to communicate and interact with the child, that adult is reacting constantly to the child's response to what they're saying. So the parent, that adult, is constantly modifying how they're talking, the length of the sentence, the vocabulary they're using, the speed of which they talk, constantly modifying that based on the reaction of the child. They're not aware of it, they're not conscious of it, but they all do it. You know, if the child starts paying, you know, stops paying attention, you know, you change the subject, you slow it down, you speed it up, you simplify it, you're constantly moving, modifying based on the response of the child. As soon as we move away from that one-on-one, -on -one, the quality of that input changes dramatically. Even two-to-one, it changes dramatically. Now, unfortunately, today we have so, so many of our preschool children who are in daycare environments or in preschool environments, you know, supposedly, unfortunately, perceived as an opportunity. You know, uh, the data, the data is, is kind of tough to interpret on this. Reality appears to be that children from underprivileged environments, underprivileged homes, do better in a quality preschool environment. I would seriously question whether or not children from homes where there is more language, there more, is more contact, are better off in preschool. I doubt it. I think it's really hard to beat that quality one-on-one, -on -one. and we see, it, we see it every day at NACD with the, the families we work with. Now, those kids who are getting that quality one-on-one -on -one are developing the fastest and the best almost universally. Because again, quality input. Quality input is what's going to help develop the sequential processing. Now sequential processing is how many pieces can you take in and process, understand. And typically that development starts occurring with a child as, you know, at about 
you know, a number of months of age, being able to process a piece of information. And <clears throat> then as they're going one, 18 months, pushing two years, they, they, they start processing two pieces. One piece would be the child being able to uh, wave by on command, all right, or touch their nose on command. Two pieces would you say to Johnny, Johnny, can you touch your nose and your ear? Or Johnny, can you jump up and down and turn around? You know, that would be a two. Or Johnny, can you say red, yellow? That would be a two. All right, so that development occurs sequentially. <clears throat> and we, we actually, on uh, part of our foundation, have what we call the Simply Smarter Project. And we've collected data on well over 10,000 people and looked at how that development occurs. And that's very interesting data because essentially what we're finding is that the development of auditory processing is actually slower than what had been previously perceived. At one point it was perceived it came up about a digit a year. Uh, we're now seeing it's, it's significantly slower than that typically. We also discovered that sequential processing tends to peak in our 20s and then begin to decline unless there's intervention. Uh, which which is a little scary, you know, if we start thinking that everyone who's, who's past their 20s is already heading downhill in terms of their sequential processing, uh, you know, like weren't working on it and, you know, maintaining it or even hopefully improving it, which can be done. You know, one of the nice things is we have, we have determined without a doubt after working on sequential processing for 40 years, is it develops and because it develops it changes before because it can change we can change it we can dramatically accelerate the rate at which it develops and we can also very very significantly increase the level to which it develops which has very fantastic corresponding changes and improvement in our global function or ability to function now back looking at those young children in sequential processing, sequential processing is again how many pieces you can take in. And <clears throat> the number of pieces you can take in also determines number of pieces you can hold together and manipulate. And that's actually a difference between what's called short-term memory and working memory. And if you will, that determines complexity of thought, and complexity of thought affects determines behavior. All right, so relative to that, we have behavior patterns we see with children who process a one <clears throat> versus a two versus a three or four or five or above. Uh, simple picture, a child who processes a one, a baby, is easy to get along with. You can give the baby something, they're happy, you take it away, they don't much care. Okay? Because all they're processing is that one thing. Uh, we get into a two, we get into what are typically called terrible twos. Terrible twos are those kids who are having tantrums all the time. And they tantrum because their complexity of thought is I want or don't want. That's it. I want, don't want, get a tantrum either way. You can't deal with them. You can't reason with them because they can't process that information. We see a behavior pattern when kids sequence three, which we, we call lock and block. Essentially what you see with the child at that level of function is that if they perceive something as fun, as safe, as non-threatening, they're happy to do it, they smile, they're off and going. If they perceive what you want them to do as being important, scary, threatening, or therapy, they tend to just lock up on you. They'll look right through you as though they don't understand a word you're saying. Right? But what's interesting often, you can come back a couple of minutes later, and if their perception then is, oh, well, this is okay, then they're fine to do it. So it's called lock and block at three. When we get into the fours, we get complexity of thought that produces a lot of imaginary thought, imaginary play comes in, a lot of fantasy comes in. All right, when we get into fives, we see actually the lower end of what we expect at 
uh, adult level function, which is much more maturity of thought and appropriate function, although not good yet. One of the important things in education is that children be perceived by their level of processing and complexity of thought rather than their chronological age. You know, you can have children in a first grade classroom with a broad, broad range of processing ability and a broad range of complexity of thought, a broad range of maturity, and a broad range of specific needs in terms of how information needs to be presented. Now, if you have a child who processes a three and you're talking to them in complex sentences, they're going to pick out some key words and react to it. They're not understanding everything you're saying. So it's vital to understand educationally you know, how, how to determine where the child is and, and treat them appropriately, and most significantly, to provide them with the opportunity to really develop that processing, develop the complexity of thought. In other videos, I'll talk about a construct of thought that shows how short-term memory leads to working memory and working memory leads to executive function and so forth. But this, this is the basis, the basis of how we take in information, how we learn, and how we think. So this is very important. And it's vital that parents of young children understand that a big part of the job of helping your children ultimately reach their potential is what you do in those first few years, making sure that the ear health is good, those ears are clear, that you're not dealing with, with chronic middle ear fluid, and making sure that your child is receiving as much quality one-on-one -on -one language, verbal, input, interaction as possible. You know, you've got that kid following mom around and mom's talking to him for hours on end. That's tough to beat. And if you're looking at pictures and you're looking at books and you're talking and you're out, out and about and exploring and talking, that is a foundation for ultimate educational success, maturity of thought, and global success as you can get. You know, research is showing that your processing skills show better how well you're going to function educationally than your IQ does. So developing these skills is huge. Understanding them is huge. Yeah, thank you.